You see, Jesus is perfect because he's God. We can't be perfect because we aren't God, but we can become more and more like Jesus every day. It's a process and it has a special name. Sunday school lady? It's a really great word. Sanctification. Say it with me. Sanctification. Sanctification. Oh, I love it. What is it? Just as the word justification means to justify, the word sanctification means to sanctify. But I don't know what sanctify means. I wasn't finished. Sanctify means to make holy or to free from sin. Remember when we said God wants to save us from the stain of sin? That's justification. We get a new label. In God's eyes, we become righteous. But we also said God wants to save us from the power of sin. So sin no longer has control over us, no longer whispers in our ears. We become more like Jesus. That's sanctification. Good morning, friends, both here and online. We are grateful that you are here. And uh, wow, uh, we had a great first service and... Uh, the uh, Holy Spirit has been with us all morning, and we're going to continue to celebrate uh, what he has done. Uh, this is probably the most theological sermon I've ever preached, and the fact that I'm closing in on 100 years old, uh, this would, uh, means you need to put on your special thinking caps this morning and be challenged uh, by God's Word, <laughs> and, and that is... Uh, that is, the, that is the key for us Christians, is to be challenged God, in God's word. And, you know, we, we've been on a journey, uh, all of us. Uh, it's one of the great metaphors of life. And there's some great journeys described in the Bible. We've, uh, this ser uh, series of sermons is, is uh, entitled The Journey of Grace. And uh, one of the journeys that uh, we uh, see in the Bible is when Abra God called Abraham uh, out of Ur, uh, of the Chaldees, and uh, then uh, he uh, took him, he and his family, uh, on about a thousand mile journey. It probably took him four to six months at least. Uh, and that was a, certainly a hard journey for them, but God was faithful and accomplished it in him. And then there was the unrivaled journey of God providing the people of Israel from. Uh, from Egypt to Israel, the Exodus journey took them over 40 years to complete, and it was a very hard journey for Moses and the people uh, in the longest and largest backpack trip in the history of the world, and, uh, but God was faithful to uh, accomplish that uh, in them. Uh, some of you here this morning are experiencing an incredible journey. Anybody here to testify that God has been with you and been faithful on your journey? Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, he will be faithful to accomplish it in you. Uh, and uh, Christy and I had uh, one of the most, I guess, fun and adventurous journeys that we had um, uh, was we took a, uh, a whitewater trip uh, with 16 of our friends down the Grand Canyon. It took us 15 days. Uh, and that was, of course, quite a while ago. And I, we were much younger people. And, uh, and, uh, and it was an incredible journey, and God was faithful in that journey. And um, the, big, the Grand Canyon is a big place, and we uh, use a lot of big words to describe our trip. Uh, it was awesome, stupendous, incredible, uh, magnificent. And these words attempt to describe, these big words attempt to describe uh, the beauty of the Grand Canyon and uh, big words help us describe often things that are unique. Uh, uh, things, things like, words like uh, graduation, right? Accomplishment of achieving, graduating from school. Uh, another big word is hippopotamus. And uh, we, that's a big word that describes a very big animal. Uh, and, or as uh, James called it when he was three, hippohippimus. And uh, so we're looking at some big words today to describe some very, very important uh, things uh, for us in our Christian walk. And I'm, uh, we're going to uh, use a couple videos to help us uh, get into uh, these two big words and explain them very quickly. All right. 
In the 2012 movie Batman Returns, one of Catwoman's driving motivations was her desire for a clean slate. As you might imagine, she has a pretty sordid history as an international cat burglar, and, like all of us in the age of social media, every detail of her life is on record somewhere on the World Wide Web, making it impossible for her to escape the past. But word on the streets of Gotham is that someone has developed a powerful computer program called the Clean Slate, which will erase your entire internet record from every database on the planet all with a simple click of a single button. And for reasons that are perhaps obvious, Catwoman would do anything to get her hands on it. In this respect, Catwoman is more than just a comic book supervillain. She is also a metaphor for us all. At least, the way data about us accumulates on the internet until it starts to define us and control us is one of the growing social issues of our day. Harvard professor Jonathan Zittrain uses the term reputational bankruptcy to talk about all this. The web never forgets, he reminds us, and as more and more of our lives are lived online, it becomes increasingly difficult to escape the impact of our digital footprints. What we need, Zittrain argues, is some way to declare reputational bankruptcy and start over. Like if the internet allowed you a one-time pulling of a lever that would delete your digital identity and you could just start fresh. The concept of reputational bankruptcy is a helpful image for something the Bible calls justification by faith. The idea is that we are justified before God, not by works, keeping the Old Testament law or adhering to some human-defined moral code, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Strictly speaking, the term justification is a legal term that describes a judge rendering a not guilty verdict in a court of law. To be justified is to be declared not guilty. But what exactly does this mean? How does God declare us not guilty on the basis of our faith in Christ? And what does this justification actually look like for us in real life? Well, this is where the clean slate comes in handy. Because in the same way that all the digital data that's accumulated about us on the internet has all sorts of implications for our present, impacting our ability to get a job, to secure a bank loan, to get a date, and so on, so much so that our digital identity can come to define us in all sorts of unhealthy ways, so too with sin. Biblically, sin is not just about the moral failings of the past that need forgiveness. It is also about how these moral failings define us and have all sorts of implications for our present. Our ability to serve God, our ability to commune with Him, our ability to take our place as one of His people. We don't just need forgiveness, we need a brand new spiritual identity. And justification by faith is for our spiritual identities what the clean slate is to our digital identities. On the cross, Christ stands in our place as our fully human representative, and through his own death, he puts to death the entire sin record of our lives. He canceled the accusation that stood against us, is how the Bible puts it, nailing it to the cross. Through his own death, he wipes the slate clean, and then through his resurrection on the other side, he offers us a brand new identity to live, united with his resurrection life. In a very real way, putting our faith in Christ is like declaring reputational bankruptcy and so allowing God to justify us, to wipe the record clean so that Christ's identity can now define us. And like it says in one place, having been justified like this through faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that just about some of the best stuff you ever heard? Well, in this story, uh, the Catwoman is more than a comic book superhero, and I'm gonna, uh, the video goes so fast, I'm going to take some time to explain uh, what they presented to us. Uh, chances are we have a personal history on the Internet, but even more basic, we have a personal history that is uh, in our own minds and hearts. And some of our personal history can be proud of, like, Showing up at church this morning or watching online this morning. Uh, and, uh, but some of our personal history is uh, charged with regret. And like Catwoman, we would love to discover a, the highly sought after fictitious computer program called The Clean Slate. In this story, she aggressively attempted to discover how to obtain the clean slate so that she could erase the negative things of her past. And if you're like me, you can relate to the idea of the clean slate. Uh, as our personal decisions tend to define us, they are things in our past that we would all love to have wiped clean. Like the Catwoman, you might find it difficult to escape the digital footprint of the data that accumulates about you on the internet. In fact, we find it kind of creepy. How do they know what I buy? 
How do they know where I've been? It is. This is a little bit unnerving. Well, Harvard professor uh, Jonathan uh, Citrain uses the term reputational bankruptcy to talk about all of this. And we sense that living online can begin to define us and control us. And he says that social media is one of the primary societal ills of our day. He reminds us that the web never forgets. As more of our lives are lived online, it becomes increasingly more difficult to escape the impact of our digital footprints. What we need, Professor Citrine argues, is some way to claim the idea of relational bankruptcy, where one could just start over fresh. It would be as if the internet allowed you a one-time pushing of a button that would erase all of the places that you had been and the things that you had done. And in doing so, you could have a new identity and a new self. The concept of the idea of relational bankruptcy is a helpful image for something that the Bible calls justification by faith. This idea is that we are justified before God, not by works, but like keeping some human-defined moral code, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 promises, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. As a promise to us from the Apostle Paul. In this way, we're made right in God's sight by our faith in his promises. We're justified, according to Romans 5, therefore we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Justification paves the way for our journey of grace. So according to the Bible, we're justified by faith, but how does that work in real life? Well, there is this metaphor of the cat woman needing a fresh new start, makes things clean for her, and clean for us. And just as the clean slate program idea can wipe out our digital past, so also God, through Christ, can forgive our sins of the past. In forgiving the sins of the past, Christ Jesus sets us free from the power of sin and death, according to Romans 8, 2. Amen. So our digital identity can become, uh, as, it, as it can become to define us, in all sorts of unhealthy ways, so too it is with sin. Biblically, sin is not just the moral failings of the past that need forgiveness. It is also about how these moral failings define us and have all sorts of implications for our present lives. When we're forgiven, we're justified with God, and in being justified with God, we just don't need forgiveness. We need a brand new spiritual identity. Justification by faith is for our spiritual identities to what the clean slate could be for our digital identities. Because of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, he put the death our entire sin record. And he canceled the power of sin that we have had brought condemnation upon us. In fact, Romans 8.1 says, If there, there is therefore now no condemnation... For those who are in Christ Jesus. All right. Let's say that together. There is therefore. There is no condemnation. For those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. In fact, uh, John 3.17 reminds us that, that uh, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. So it's not... Christ who comes to condemn. It is that we are not condemned. Our sin is what condemns us. Yes, but Christ has come to set us free through the power of salvation, and we are justified by faith in his co-suffering love. And Jesus came, uh, overcame the power of sin and death and condemnation. This is how he wiped our slate clean and gives us a brand new identity. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, the Apostle Paul declares, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Hallelujah. Yes. Uh, because of his great love for us, for us, we have been justified by our faith in the resurrected Lord. Our past failures and rebellion towards God have been forgiven so that we are made right in God's sight. We have been justified. 
Someone once declared that the word justification means it is just as if I had never sinned. No longer are the sins of the past defined, defining our identity. We have a new identity in Christ. Yes, the old things have passed away and all things have become new. It is as if on life's journey that we were walking, you were headed down a dark, lonely road filled with discouragement and failure. But God intervened and offered a beautiful new path for you to walk. Your journey of discouragement and sin has become a journey of grace and love. Can you say that with me? Love. Not just love. You know, this is not Donny Osmond. This is not a puppy love thing. Um, this is real love. That's right. This is a love that comes from God himself for us. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. And it's just as if we had never sinned. But pastor, I can't forget my sin. What do I do with that? Well, first of all, we beat ourselves up. And then Satan jumps on it and adds to it. But God chooses to forgive us and to forget. Wow. There are several passages in the Bible that indicate that God forgives and forgets. In Isaiah 43, 25, he says, I am the Lord that blots out your transgressions and remembers your sin no more. Hebrews 10, 18 tells us that God says, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. This is the good news of the gospel. It'll set us free. What God forgives, he also forgets. It's, a, it's affirmed all through scripture. Uh, it's not that he couldn't, for, couldn't remember it. He's omniscient. He knows all things, but he chooses to forget. When God forgives our past sins, he puts it out of his mind. He erases it from the pages of time, and he forgets it. He chooses not to remember it. Uh, Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And the prophet Micah said, you will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. And I'm reminded of a famous sermon by evangelist Dwight L. Moody. And he said uh, that God not only throws the sins in the deepest sea, according to Micah the prophet, but he also puts up a sign that says, no fishing allowed. <laughs> so don't go back to the junk that used to... You know, be there, or, and, and don't go back to, uh, to uh, don't go fishing for uh, anything new that would, would trip you up, would harm you. Um, God's forgiveness is made complete, and you are justified and restored through Jesus' great love. All right, I think we're ready for our second word, sanctification, and our second video. There's this interesting phenomenon in physics where sound vibrations in one object can cause a nearby object to produce sound if the original sound is produced at just the right frequency or pitch. All material objects have what is called a resonant frequency, which is the natural frequency at which it vibrates, and a sound wave oscillating perfectly at the object's resonant frequency will cause it to start vibrating spontaneously. If, for instance, you were to hold down the G note on a piano so that the string is free to vibrate, and then you plunk the G note an octave below it, the vibration of the lower note will cause the higher string naturally to sound even though you didn't strike it, simply because the lower note is vibrating at the higher string's resonant frequency. A note that is sounded at the resonant frequency of a crystal goblet, if it's loud enough, will cause the goblet to vibrate so much that it shatters. This is called sympathetic vibration, and not only does it make for some fascinating science experiments, it also provides us with a vivid analogy for an aspect of the Christian life that is absolutely vital but often and overlooked, something called sanctification. Sanctification refers to the process whereby Christians become holy. It is about acquiring and living in holiness, and the Bible is quite clear that this is essential to the Christian life. In one place it says it as bluntly as can be, that without holiness no one can see God. 
The challenge here is that often the language of holiness conjures up for us images of somber people who have a long list of things they do and don't do and who feel they need to impose this list on everyone else. But this is not how the Bible conceives of holiness. The Bible continually describes it as something that God does in us and through us as he claims us for himself and works his holiness out in us. In one place it says it like this, May the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. In this sense, holiness is an objective characteristic or quality that God imparts to those who belong to Jesus, not a subjective quality that we obtain through moral effort. We are, in one sense, passive recipients of our holiness. And yet at the same time, holiness is, in fact, about a way of life. It is about men and women actively thinking and speaking and living in a way that reflects God's own holiness. In one place, the Bible says we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. In another place it says we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Well, these two pictures of holiness, that it is something we passively receive, but also something we actively pursue, can be brought together perhaps if we think about it with the analogy of sympathetic vibration. Because in sympathetic vibration, the sounding note is at just such a frequency that it causes the adjacent object to vibrate spontaneously. And at the same time, there is something about the nature of the object that it will vibrate if it meets a sound wave at the perfect pitch. Our holiness is a matter of our sympathetic vibration, so to speak, with God's own holiness. The sounding note, you might say, is the Holy Spirit. And because this note is indeed a perfect pitch, perfectly conveying to us God's perfect holiness, when it comes into contact with our hearts, passive though they may be, it causes us to begin vibrating in sympathetic harmony with Him. That is to say, our thoughts and words and deeds take on the character and the quality of His thoughts and words and deeds. In this way, we are altogether passive in our sanctification and yet deeply active as we live in harmony with his holiness. Or as the Bible says it, we will be holy because he himself is holy. Amen. Be holy because he is holy. Now, sanctification is a process by which Christians become holy, but it is not in our own strength or our own righteousness that we become holy. It's about acquiring and living a holy life that is not in our own flesh. Sanctification is an act of God in us and a daily choice on our part. It is a journey of grace. The Bible is quite clear that this is an essential part of the journey for the disciples of Jesus. In Hebrews 12, we're told, without holiness, no one can see God. In fact, to live a holy life in the power of the Holy Spirit is one of the distinctives of our branch of the tree of the Christian church. However, to live a holy life is not something that is to be attempted in our own strength. Living a holy life does not happen merely through the power of our own will, although God uses our will and fortitude to help us grow in a holy and sanctified life. To live a holy life, God marries his will with our will. In desiring to be a godly person, we submit to his will, and it gives us our sanctity in our daily journey. Now, there is a problem that's explained in this video that sometimes the concept of living a holy life conjures up ideas of a group of people who have a long list of things that we do and we don't do. But this is not how the Bible conceives of what holy, holiness or sanctification is. The Bible continually describes holiness as something that God does in us and through us as God claims us for himself and empowers us to live a godly life. As we journey in Christian maturity, the Holy Spirit continues to grow us and works in his holiness in us. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, May the God of all peace himself sanctify you wholly. In a sense, holiness is a spiritual quality that God imparts to us, but is also dependent on our will to live it out. We receive the holy life of the Holy Spirit as God sanctifies us through his perfect love. 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 Amen. Profoundly, holiness or sanctification becomes a way of life. Holiness is an act of women and men choosing to live and walk and speak in a way that reflects God's character traits. It is not something that is accomplished by keeping a set of laws, but is accomplished by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit each and every day. 
In his challenge of holy living to believers to the church in Rome, Paul admonishes them to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And then he wrote to the church in Philippi, challenging them to live out your salvation, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then uh, when God's, uh, God's holiness comes into contact with our hearts, it brings salvation with fear and respect. Amen. In this way, the Holy Spirit causes our thoughts and words and deeds to resonate with the thoughts and words and deeds of God. Supernaturally, we begin to take on the characteristics of God's persona. When the Holy Spirit controls our lives, we are drawn to godly thoughts, page 12, and godly things. No, it's, this is only 20 minutes. I, I timed it. Yeah, that's right. I've, I've got it. I've got it. All right. His direction for our journey becomes a paramount concern to us. Branches in the trail of our journey that used to be tempting options now would be paths that we would avoid. The Holy Spirit leads us away from the decisions that would lead to our destruction. That is, if we listen to his direction. Simply and clearly, sanctification is allowing God to make us more like Jesus. One of the great promises of the New Testament is found in 1 Corinthians 10.13, where the Apostle Paul says, the fulfillment of the ages, meaning Jesus, has come to us. But if you think that you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. But God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way of escape for you that you can endure it. I found this to be true in my life. God will provide a way of escape for every temptation that comes your way. In this way, the Holy Spirit of God helps us to stand up to the fiery darts that the enemy throws our way. And we're able to say no to his evil schemes that come against us. And these fiery darts that Paul mentions are known as temptations. Now, the Bible tells us that temptations are different than sin. Sin is giving in to temptations. Sin is a voluntary transgression against a known law of God. In other words, if you know something is wrong, an action, an attitude, an addiction, then it's wrong. It is sin. Sin is going against the spiritual and moral laws that God has put forth in the Bible to protect you from the dark side. We believe that actual or personal sin is a violation of God's laws of love and in relation to Jesus Sin can be defined as unbelief. Now, temptation is a routine part of life. We cannot escape it. The experience of temptation is part of what makes Christ's relationship to us one of trust and hope. We need him. We need him to help us stand against temptation. He keeps us from being tempted beyond what we can resist. God promises that in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to uh, respond to any given temptation by saying, no, learning to say no to something that is going to destroy your life. God is actively working to help those who are in Christ, who want to do what is right and to be victorious. We're not supposed to be tripped up by every little sin that comes our way. We're supposed to choose victory. We're not like animals. They just are, are given to their, their own desires. We are moral creatures with a ability to say yes and no. In fact, we make, this might confuse you a bit, estimated over 10,000 decisions every day. That's a little scary, except for you've already figured out how to do it. That's great. All right. All right. Uh, if sin is breaking the known laws of God, then understandably... I can probably go five minutes without sinning. In fact, all of you here may not have gone against one of God's known laws in the last half hour. Yeah, praise the Lord. It can be done. You see where I'm going with this? If you can go for a half hour... Maybe you could go, with the Holy Spirit's power, a whole day. 
without breaking one of God's known laws. Hallelujah. As we mature in Christ, we can choose to say no to temptation and to the things that we know will destroy us. It is estimated that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are enabled to say no to temptation, to every temptation that is coming your way. Learn to love victory over temptation. Don't love the world or the things of the world. Love a victorious, spirit-filled life that is cleansed from sin. How do I know, Pastor Dave, that this is possible? I have some pretty bad habits, Pastor Dave. Well, let me tell you, I want to illustrate by a really great brother, a friend of mine that's uh, in, in our, our fellowship. And 20 years ago, uh, he lay in a hospital bed at Cahuilla Delta, dying from alcoholism. And a very wise and thoughtful nurse sat down on the edge of his bed, which is against protocol, might have been a little easier back then, to have a, a, a talk with him and said, do you know why you can't stop drinking? And he thought for a moment and he said, no. And she said, because you're addicted. You're an addict. Alcohol is literally killing you. Slowly. But surely. And he said, wow. Why didn't I think of that? Psychologists call that a disclosure. Pastors call it, wake up, dude. <laughs> and he did. And every day since then, he has said no to the temptation of taking a drink again. Because he knew he had to learn to hate that which was killing him. We have to learn to come to hate that which is killing us. That's a good thought. Not too many things we should hate, but we should hate sin. Hate sin and, and love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Colossians chapter 2 reminds us that we're dead in our, we were dead in our sins, but God made us alive in Christ. He forgave us all of our sins and canceled the charge against us. Now there's an encouraging word. In Romans 3, Paul goes on, he says, We have been justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And likewise, in Ephesians 2, Paul reminds us that we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. We were thanatos, necros, we were dead. But God, who is rich in mercy, those are two wonderful words, but God, who is rich in mercy which reminds me so vividly of uh, my favorite words in Spanish in the entire New Testament. God who is rich in mercy in English, in Spanish, muy rico in misericordia. Apparently there are two words for mercy in, the New, in, in uh, Spanish. One is merced. The, so the merced river is a river of mercy. The other, other word is misericordia. Muy rico in misericordia. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he has set us free from the power of sin and death. It's by faith that we are saved and justified. Paul writes in Romans 5, not only this, we've been justified, but we also receive sanctification through our Lord Jesus Christ in whom we now have received reconciliation through his atonement. By faith and obedience to the Holy Spirit, we move upward in maturity. Sanctification leads to a victorious Christian life. This is the good news of the gospel. This is why we came to church today. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to transform our lives and say no to the power of sin and temptation over us. Hallelujah. We thank Jesus for his redemptive love and for his great, marvelous plan for us.